Uh, the Systematic Geekology, we are the priests to the geeks. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, joined today by a special friend. You've heard him before on the show. You've seen him multiple times over, but uh, Trip Fuller is here, as unfortunately it looks like his camera just went out. I mean, oh, there he is. Hey, Trip, How's it going? It's going great. Looking forward to some Battlestar Galactica excitement. Absolutely. Uh, I am a huge fan of the show have been ever since i first watched it uh with my dad forever ago we'll get into that later we, so trip this is part of our polit uh, primarily political series where we're going through different fandoms thing how they handle the politics within the shows uh you've been listening you know so one of the things we're doing in this special little side series is asking everyone like who their favorite political figure is from real life or fandom Ooh, ah i mean that's it's hard like uh, if we're meaning like someone that held office, like the whole New Deal period is my favorite period of American history. And Ooh. Uh, but um, I wasn't alive for that. I'm I mostly am the uh, perpetually disappointed uh, uh, Bernie bro of sorts. That's tends to be my experience with America. Deeply suspicious of the uh the the unity around our foreign policy and its deep commitment to the military industrial complex so i see i see now uh i was already on an episode and i already talked about paul von oberstein from legend of the galactic heroes being my favorite so i'll go with a real life one this time around and i know if he's my favorite favorite but he's the first one that popped in my head and that being james polk who came in for four years had like five things he said he was going to do, accomplished those five things, and then left the system. That kind of makes me happy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that I'm, bygone era there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the man had other things and controversies in his life that we shouldn't be happy about, but uh, what politician has ever been perfect? You know, what person has ever been perfect? So in addition to all that, uh, is there anything you've been geeking out on trip recently? Well, I... Uh, I just watched Dune 2, and that was okay. spectacular. Yeah, uh, everyone look forward to the What's New episode that uh, Will and Justin and TJ and uh, Will's daughter, whose name escapes me at the moment, just did. Uh, very good stuff. So let's get into the series proper. Like I said, Primary Political is kind of focused on the politics, not only in our world, but also in the worlds of the fandoms that we exist in and it's nice to have you trip you know as much as we love lord of the rings here like you have other fandoms you're a part of and this is most definitely one of them from what i understand so this is battlestar galactica how would you explain that to someone who'd never seen the show before well um i mean there are two elements i mean it's it's a story that's been retold right so they're the 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 version that came out three years 2004 three years after 9 11 uh picked up um an old uh tv show that apparently was big it seems kind of cheesy and not that wonderful to me but i know people get really into it um but it is uh it i mean it's an exploration uh using science fiction of humanity's biggest problem um uh, namely uh our desire to be like god and a whole mm. bunch of different ways um i'm sure we'll end up getting to talk about it but it gets explored in our relationship to technology. It gets explored in relationship to what we create and then how it recreates us. It gets explored. And uh, what can we as a species break the cycle of victim and violator? Um, and the big, big kind of thing, uh, I guess we should just, it's spoiler alerts, like, because there's no way to talk about this without it. But at the yes. very beginning of each episode with this really cool music, um, it goes, you know, the Cylons, we created them. Uh, then they evolved and then they rebelled and they have a plan, right? So like, that's the framing of it with this mini series. It starts with a very much nine 11 resonating uh, nuclear attack kind of thing. Um, but as you go through the, as you go through the whole story, we realize that there's been cycles that have gone like this where humans have uh, uh, like evolved technologically to the point of creating um, artificial intelligence um, and, and creating here are the Cylons, they end up rebelling, 
There's a big war. Only a few people survive. Eventually they get to another hospitable planet and it happens again. And so the, the story uh, is, is one like you're, as you're piecing together what's happening in the, the 50,000 people left on the one ship without enough technology to get hacked, uh, you discover that human beings have acted a fool in this way and then thought the solution was a, a violent attacks on their creation, the Cylons. And Cylons had this like, oh, we have to eliminate them thing. So there's this whole cycle of violence that you learn you're a part of as you're experiencing this one big story, um, you know, throughout all the seasons. So it's a, and, and it's got like one of the coolest cast of all time. Oh, yes. So like, it's just, <laughs> Uh, it, it's a banger in every way possible. It does the coolest space fights with low tech um, that, you know, it's just, th there's really no reason that if you haven't watched this show that you should not go dedicate some time to go watch it because it's just, it's just delicious in every way. Science fiction's delicious. And that's not just because Starbuck is in it, but a part of it. Yeah, a two episode miniseries and four seasons worth of some solid good fun. Like you guys are missing out if you haven't watched this show. Now, this is like you mentioned a a reimagining of an earlier shows from 1978. You know, when the new hotness was that uh, that sexy new thing on the block, Star Wars. Everyone decided, well, we got to have our own slice of the pie, and but we have to do it on a television budget, and that's how Battlestar Galactica came about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it it's okay i'm glad it exists if it didn't exist we wouldn't have the reimagining that we do in 2003 2004 it's fine you, you get some wacky goofiness and then you get galactica 1980 and you kind of wish she would just die you know <laughs> that, that it, there's, there's some good things to choose from there's some things you probably just avoid there's a baseball episode on earth <laughs> Yeah, like like that's uh, if you're going to go to Earth, too, you may as well play baseball. Yeah, so that's that. So, Trip, what was your introduction to Galactica? Did you start from the very beginning? Were you brought in later on? Oh well, yeah, I watched it as it was coming out. I was uh, in Divinity School at Wake Forest University, and those of us that were, uh, uh, you know, the geeky types, watched it, and then debate it throughout and uh so the, the a number of times me and all of my uh cigar smoking whiskey drinking friends watched it and then would sit outside and discuss it as high um so it, it's really hard to untangle how much i love the show from that kind of like first viewing with like people that remained your friends uh at the time you're kind of discovering your theological sea legs and understanding your vocational identity and like encountering all the new things you discover in divinity school. Um, and we all were right out of undergrad, right? So nine 11 happened when I was a sophomore, um, in college. And then, um, you know, that we, this, this show kicks off right as we're in the middle of Iraq and things. Um, so it was a, uh, uh, the kinds of things it was making commentary on when we look back were what was going on in it. So it, it was, it was like simultaneously amazing sci-fi. And if you're at that period of time where one of your recreational activities is arguing about religion and politics with your friends, it's, it, it's like, what, what better context can you imagine? Um, later I, I rewatched it. Um, like binge watched the thing during uh, sometime when I had the flu uh, years later and maybe four or five years ago when I was teaching a uh, an undergrad philosophy and culture class, it was one of the shows we used because undergrad students hadn't seen it. And so I when I'm teaching like philosophy of religion type things or philosophy and culture things, uh, I find using um sci-fi or zombie apocalypse stories or you know things like that or um doing game of thrones and lord of the rings and contra like those kind of things allow people to learn the language and concepts and such that you use doing philosophy of religion without talking about 
one of the students personal religion in the class so you like learn how to use the ideas without different people getting defensive or uh such plus um it it's also just entertaining right like if you're be like do you want to go read hegel's lectures on the philosophy of religion or do you want to watch battlestar galactica what do you my homework, Diff my homework yeah the, the students that did their homework went up dramatically <laughs> Yeah, um, I started not too long after it premiered. I know my dad was there day one because he had watched the original series. And, you know, that there was a whole uh, I remember it being in the news a couple of times like how people hated the new series because it betrayed the original and all that. It's like, well, yeah, I agree with you if it was a full on remake versus a reimagining. But we're mm. trying new things here. So uh, and then I got into it with, uh, you know, him being like, hey, you know, I think you would enjoy this, too. Uh, we would watch it together uh, as it was coming out. Loved looking forward to those nights. It was a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes I think he had to record because he's also a basketball coach. So some days we'd have to record it, wait to watch it together. So it just meant a lot more to me for that, that to happen. Then in college, I had a good friend, uh, a mutual friend that Joshua and I both have, who every Friday from in the afternoon – uh, we had another friend who had never seen it before, so we invited her to watch it with us, and we would do that pretty much every Friday afternoon. And it was just a lot of fun, kind of like hey, discussing the topics and the themes that were going on in the show on my second watch through of it. Uh, and, and also playing the board game together with them, which is incredibly fun and a great way to destroy friendships, uh, but we'll get to that later on. So that's how I got into it. That's how Trip got into it. Now, I got to ask, you know, they've got a great cast here, like you mentioned before, like the actors, actresses here, phenomenal. But is there one in, in this group that's like your favorite? Oh, I mean, Starbucks, my favorite. But um, one of the things about the cast in general uh, is it, it was one of the first sci-fi shows where the it had more powerful female characters than male characters. Um, and, uh, and, and, and a lot of the moral complexity, uh, that happens through the miniseries in the four seasons. Um, it, it, it's not possible without like a cast where easily for, I could think of four of the characters that could be favorites if they were in other shows, you know? Um, so that to me is, it, it's hard to, it's hard to pick. But um, I, I just it might just be I think Starbuck is the most attractive sci-fi female, um, and that's like with six as an option. So it's you know it's just there's that element. Um, but uh, also the the uh, Gaius character is the one who I th is the most difficult acting job because he becomes the foil mm -hmm. for learning what at least I think the show's big goal of learning is. Um, but he's just so annoying and gross through so much of it that um, it's really hard to call him a favorite, but yeah. Yeah. So what about you? Like it, it do you have a hard time naming a favorite or uh, hard time having a favorite? No hard time. Like who would be after them? Yes. As in like, cause there's a lot of great people to choose from, but, it's Baltar. It's guy's Baltar. He's my guy. He he's a slimy, disgusting slug of a man who is going to do whatever it takes to be on top. And whether that is to be like, I know exactly what the Cylons are planning, or I know exactly how this science works, even though I'm making it up on the fly, or I have this angel-like thing talking to me every now and then that gives me hints, or like I'm going to become president now. It, seeing his growth, it's like because there is a person in there with morals. But they often get shut up by his desires and saying, you could be so much better. You could be this. I, I want you to be better than yourself. But also, he's not a complete monster. Like, even in the midst of the, the Capricorn occupation, like, he's not selling humanity out completely. Like, he's trying to work against the Cylons. Th there's a lot of moral complexity to him that I really appreciate. In, in another show, he'd have been written poorly. And in the original show, he's kind of like a mustache twirling evil villain versus what we have here like the it's night and day the difference now if i had to pick someone else more of a minor character but romo lampkin the attorney 
who ends up defending him with Lee. Love him. Like Mark Shepard has such a presence with him. This is like pre Crowley for Supernatural. Mark Shepard, and he does a phenomenal job. Yeah. In in one of the things about um uh about his character and people, it, it obviously if you haven't seen it, this is just going to ruin everything. But um, in the mini series, you discover that he's the one who's responsible for the nuking of earth um, that he gave uh, the codes, uh, uh, you know, access to everything um, to six. Uh, and, and, and that uh, guilt that it generates in him becomes the story he uses to justify throughout the show, all kinds of other immoral deeds, be it lying, manipulating. Um, he'll obfuscate in like masterful ways. He will uh, leverage people's passion and desires for safety uh, to, to generate new enemies. Like he, it, it, you can always see throughout the story that there's both this, like the version of himself he's telling himself. And then, um, the, like who, what he's really doing. And it takes, um, it, I mean, it takes all four seasons for him to come to grips with, um, like his ultimate betrayal and then coming to grips with the consequences of him trying to, um, justify it. And I think that really sets up for, you know, the ending of both his kind of <clears throat> decision to go farm uh being on what is our earth and uh but yeah it's his in in what what's it james cal what, what's the guy that plays gaius callus james callus i think that's his name he I mean, um uh, yes yeah james callus he 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 is a remarkable actor and it's one of those things where i wonder how much you know cuz the sci-fi channel didn't know how this was going to take off and then how many seasons you would have the the ability for him to um not look like there was this giant uh disruption in his character where you're like are you really still playing the same character but sh could, like show his wrestling and kind of uh transformation as a person um when how clear the end was in mind uh, is very questionable. So I, I think he did a remarkable job. I just realized I never talked about what I was geeking out on earlier. <laughs> so let me do that real quick. It disrupts the entire flow of the conversation, but it's going to bug me if I don't do it. Uh, so real quick, not somebody's book to friends. Uh, it's about a guy who, whose grandmother uh, beat up a bunch of yokai in the past, had names in a book, and now he's got to bring them back to them. It's a ton of fun. It's a very low stakes series. So that's that. We'll get to Baltar later on in this conversation. So sorry to disrupt the flow, but I knew it would be bugging me the entire time if I didn't say anything. This happens. It happens. So moving on from that interlude, uh, in the show's backstory, as mentioned previously, we have this conflict between humanity and their cybernetic creations. We they name them the Cylons. Uh, and in Caprica, we kind of start getting that until it was canceled too soon. And they end up rebelling against their human masters for essentially being enslaved as they have evolved, in a sense, into a sapient uh, species. Uh, so what's your take on how the show handled this whole thing? And how does it factor into our more modern issues that we're dealing with, like the development of robotics and AI? Well, like when I think of the the like in particular humanity's relationship with technology. Uh, one of the things, the big reveal at the end where they get rid of technology and kind of hit a technology reset uh, when they get to earth two, which is our earth, right? Like then it flashes forward 150,000 years to the modern day. Um, part of what the technology question to me is human beings create technology. It recreates us. And this has been our relationship with it as a species forever. From the time we harness fire, we are uh, now outsourcing quite a bit of our body's energy for digesting food to fire. That's when you start to see um, the growth of our frontal cortex. What happens with a frontal cortex as a species? That's when we start to develop uh, symbolic language, um, the kinds of communication where we can cooperate 
uh, as a species with more than 140 people. That's really the birth of religion. If you look at the kind of anthropological story of religion and um, and yet human beings, when we talk about technology, we tend to like think it equals stuff that was invented after we turned 30 that we now have to use. So in when it goes to humans and technology, there's this um, we've always created it. It recreates us. And that's all kind of been there. But the technology that we're aware of and conscious of are the ones that make new demands on us that we have to like relearn what it means to live in a world where this is now part of our lives. Um, and that 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 whole story of technology uh, being at the heart of the cycle, right, of eventually creating artificial intelligence, uh, it evolves, then it <clears throat> rebels, and it starts a whole nother cycle, right, where then you end up uh, on another planet. Um, to me, that that it's kind of inviting us as a series to ask, uh, like, can human beings, given our biological hardware, uh, have a culture uh, that evolves in the way it relates to its technology um, that uh, that we don't end up uh, recreating the worst parts of ourselves in something that's autonomous with more power. Uh, and the that that this has happened over and over again um, is one place you see it. The other is that when you get to Earth 2, what do they do? They get rid of all the technology because what is required for them to do different. And this is one of the places that Balthar's character is so important. Like it, he recognizes that as a species, they have to grow through what he's done. Like they have to get to the point of having a different relationship with the other, be it the religious other, the technological creation other, like you need a kind of cultural moral fabric that enables the breaking of the victim and violator cycle. That's at, at the heart of, our species and the way we relate to each other, but also uh, what happens once we create um, and other, um, be it, you know, the uh, through technology, like the AI, or the cyclone, the cyclones here. So um, I think it's hard for us to, uh, it, it's not obvious in the show till the end, the big challenge or kind of invitation to wrestle with humanity uh, that it's putting forth like it's at the end this show's not just about the conflicts that are taking place in the present post 9 11 it's actually raising the question of is is what humans call civilization um a net good or is it the very problem that generates our destruction and uh, and that's why i found the show brilliant i always kind of wanted to know um exactly how clear the creators are on the meta observations but um like when you think of what's happening now um we demonstrate the very kind of hubris that uh balthar at the beginning of the show has like gaius is, is sitting there thinking he has the ability to master and control uh nature a uh, master and control the survivors and all these things because he's at the position of the rational understanding person. And it gives him a justification structure for all sorts of immoral things. Um, and, 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 and down to torturing. Like, I mean, you just think of it then to, then to go like, what if this shows that it, the, it ends and go and gives us a mirror and go, is this who we are? Could we be different? And that's happening precisely at the time we as uh, a nation are ex telling the story of civilization over against the axis of evil, preemptive strike, and every religious group in the world's like this is immoral. Like the the kind of challenge it puts to us using sci-fi is just uh, it, it's quite wonderful. That's why I think the uh, choosing a technology that's on our horizon as the place that we're no longer in control of its evolution um, is is insightful. Um, anyway, sorry. Hey, like, no, speak it, man. Yeah. Uh, to go to some of your earlier points, uh, you make a great point in saying that technology to us is what's being made right now versus what we're used to. And that's simply not true. Like, yeah, fire was a huge technology, uh, spears, weapons, you know, being able to hunt beyond ourselves was a huge technology, you know? And we get so used to it, we just it just becomes ingrained 
in who we are. And one of my favorite post-apocalyptic books of all time is Earth Abides. And in that, like, humanity is kind of, you know, typical scenario, humanity is kind of wiped out. But the issue being, can we maintain civilization as we used to know it? in a world where those things don't exist as much as they used to. And one of the ways it answers it is no, you're going to create something else. And in here we have that post-apocalyptic scenario. Like we had 12 colonies uh, starting with Africa that get wiped out except for 50,000 people. And that number dwindles uh, every, almost every single episode we have in the show, like, because we got complacent because we decided to make something in our own image. We took that role of God in that scenario. And I'm not saying that robotics inherently is some evil thing, but I'm saying the way it was utilized in this scenario was to say, well, you are going to be subservient to us. You're just a thing. And that's okay. Ish. If that thing hasn't developed a mind, if it hasn't been imbued with a soul of sorts, and it seems along the way that happens to the silence. And when you still treat that thing, as if it's just a thing and not a new person, that's how we get into the conflict of the series. And obviously we have some parallels there with how we've viewed other races as subhuman. And therefore we can exploit you in this manner because you're not as important as me because I'm just smarter and better than you. And I have the better technology. So obviously you're a savage and therefore whatever I do to you doesn't matter. Well, it's kind of the same thing done through robotics. And as AI is being developed here, we see how it's used not only in school with students trying to you know use chat gpt and so on and so forth to cheat and you know write their own papers for them but we also see pastors doing it too to just have one less thing to do and the the ethics of is it okay to write a sermon based on what ai has done it's all over the place there's so much that the series kind of brings up and it's like how we utilize technology and i don't think at the end of the day, this show is anti-technology, but I think it's also what are you doing with that technology that becomes the question. Yeah, yeah, and 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 one of the things about AI and that we're asking in the present that the Cylons also raise is right um, underneath, like using AI for homework or any of that, is the assumption that you're using something that's not human um, and not yours even though what it's processing, like the way AI works is actually uh, organizing algorithmically connections between such a large language set of human beings um, that it own, it works because it is us. Uh, now our relationship to it uh, is its own thing, but it's not, it's, it is alien only in the sense that we can't comprehend and control it completely, but it's not alien in that it's using anything other than uh, con content created by humans an algorithm that humans generate. And the shift we're asking now that gets asked in a more complex way with the Cylons is what happens when in and of itself, apart from human intervention, uh, it, it develops and that uh, and what do you do with technology that that, um, you, you know, one of the ways of even thinking about the end of the show in connection to humanity's long time wrestling with uh, the limits of our goodness in a world that's finite uh, and and runs on privation is uh, think about think about what happens when the Hebrew people uh, tell gen in Genesis 1 through 12, like the creation stories fall all the way through um, uh, the Tower of Babel, right? Like in it, the very beginning, the temptation is uh, of the serpent is um, you'll be like God, right? And what is it that makes you like God? Knowledge. The knowledge to do what, right? Gaius, Balthar, is the knowledge to control, to control the world around him, to control situations and challenges. And that desire to be like God uh, and control um, in in the in in the Hebrew story, it breaks down. You get Cain and Abel and this kind of this kind of battle there all the way to Babel, which is what humanity as a collective using its technology to overthrow God um, to you'll not just be like God, but you want to be God like. And it's that place where in the Hebrew uh, story that you get um, the multiplication 
of communities, right? They all don't speak the same language anymore. And here you are, right? The, the crescendo, if you think of those stories of like a snowball of violence starts uh, in the garden and then you get familial violence and then you get the violence with the land, a farming and hunter dynamic. And then it gets to, you know, uh, Noah and, and it go all the way to the, all the way to Babel. It's like, what do human beings do when they cooperate with and they gain power through technology? They want to be God. And the response there is reset. Um, yes. And, and, and so like when you think of and, – and what's the reset? The reset is the setup for why you want a people um, – you get the scandal of particularity right in Genesis 12. God chooses Abraham and Sarah, but not for themselves, but to bless them so that in the way they enact their relations, uh, they become a light to others that they 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 are chosen by God to bear the character of God in history and that's like the framework for understanding the people of Israel like the whole reset you get at the end of this where six and and Gaius are sitting there commenting right as uh, there's a there's like a proto robot on MSNBC um uh you get Gaius say to six does all this have to happen again does all this have to happen again and 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 I think that like playing that out, um, you see how the show kind of gives a, a prehistory mythology of sorts for us to ask this question again in the same way that as the people of Israel, uh, when you're trying to make sense of your origin story, um, you, what what story do you tell that is so true it captures the human predicament? That one. Um, those resonance there that the human beings, when they were – you know, that essentially emerges in the early agricultural period for human beings, the the uh, early Genesis are still ask. We're still stuck asking the same questions about how we are human in a world of multiplicity and difference culturally uh, where it's easy to generate an other. You define yourself against and outsource the villainy to them and then conquer it and tell a mastering story like all those things are still sitting there and it gets explored throughout this whole story. And then it ends and goes, oh. Does all this have to happen again? Um, anyway, I, I, yeah, that's a great question. It got me excited. I haven't thought so much about the show till you sent your notes in a while. And then I like pulled out all my lecture notes from when I taught through it. And I'm like, oh, this is good. I love Christian's questions and topics. Well, thank you. Glad to hear that. I love the idea of, hey, this is something that we've experienced, depending on how literally you interpret the Bible. And I tend to go more literal than other people. Uh, this has happened multiple times before. We've had a, a reset button in that, hey, you know, Noah's flood happens, and outside of Noah's family, there is no one who survives. And now we're back to that very small technological level that some people would argue, and I know it's all over the place, is that because humanity had one common language, we were able to advance scientifically far beyond what even our capabilities today. That I don't. I'm not going to argue that right now. That's just something people throw out. Then you have the Tower of Babel situation. Well, we have that one language. What unites us is that goal. We all want to be like God. And what's going to separate us? Scattering us among the world to where we don't have that language that unites us together. We have that same uniting. We all want to be God. But now we can't get over the fact that now I'm a different culture than you in this respect. Yeah, th This series is so, is so much fun. I'm glad I fought for this to be on the primarily political series. And I'm glad you could be along here with me for the ride. Because I've been wanting to talk about this for some time. But we can't focus on only one question. We do have other things we have to do here. So, you know, you, go, you know, simpler, you know, no big hot button issue or anything. Early on in the show, I believe second season, there is an intense debate over abortion that is exacerbated by the fact that mankind's numbers have dwindled immensely. We see, like I said, every episode, those numbers start steadily go down as time goes on. And President Roslin, who, by the way, is only president because she was the education minister and there's no one else around high enough to do the job. Yeah. It's like the, the most depressing designated survivor moment, right? Like that one person that's not at the state of the union where it blows up and you're like, who's president now? It's like that times 10. Yeah. So she has her own personal ethic ethics on how she views the issue of abortion. Like uh, in the episode proper, she decides that there's this young woman who needs, who, who says she needs to have one. Uh, she allows her to have it, then passes legislation preventing it. Do you agree with how she handled the scenario or not? Well, I, I think it's, uh, you know, one of the things about it is it, it reveals the way um, 
short of having an absolutist statement on anything politically, how the context will shift one's moral reasoning, right? So uh, in in our context, you could imagine can, um, people saying, look, um, we are getting past the limits of um, people on this planet and we don't need more humans. We keep growing nonetheless, right? And so the survival instinct to make the logic in the present uh, if you're just thinking of what our our uh eco our the ecology can bear you might go oh well let's limit uh the number of births and there's all sorts of different ways governments have done that at different times um and so the the putting it in a situation where um the survival of the species um would demand more births as opposed to less right is is a way at getting you to to it kind of forcing the viewer to go um is the answer to this question uh a situationally determined or is in in the context and in, in the space of humanity one or is it about uh a a kind of moral universal about the dignity of uh, of a human being um and and i think that's kind of the 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 brilliance of that situation now her pragmatic one of like right after um she kind of makes the new law of not retroactively right punishing the young girl um that seems like the only uh reasonable thing to do and that's if you're sitting there leading it otherwise right like you uh you're you're now like creating a law and making it retroactively um you know punishing someone uh you also see um someone who has a deep commitment and sees the need by the per from the voices of people she would normally demonize and think are wrong to that they they have some truth within it that she now has to become a part of right so like i find her character through it um it, it's one of those where could you have chose otherwise you you kind of want to go no I, I i think she makes sense but then that's like one of Gaius's most nasty moves, right? In that in that episode is like he gets up there and he basically coerces her into doing it, right? He goes, I've been tracking the data of everyone that, you know that's alive and that number's going down. And if we uh, allow this kind of logic, then he he universalizes the that one instance, extends it out, and he's like, in 17 years, there won't be any more humans. Um that uh it, so that like he gives her the justification for changing the law, right? Where we're going to outlaw abortions. And then he uses it uh, and says, Oh, um, the, the, the Cylons don't want us to have any freedom. And, and we got to preserve freedom, even if it's against, you know, like, or, or even going to be a free people if we start passing laws like this. So now y'all can vote for me for president. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, um, it's one of those times where you kind of just want to punch him. Um, <laughs> like she's wrestling with it as a real moral choice, and he's utilizing people's deep moral commitments to get votes, which, uh, you know, depending on the election, we have political parties that use the same issues uh, to generate votes. Um, and I, 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 I just think too many, we have too many people that treat it like Gaius Balthar and not uh, uh, our, you know, our, our favorite space president. Yes. Uh, well said. I, obviously, it's a complicated issue in the real world, but in the context of a fictional universe like this, you have the whole, like, hey, our species is dying off. Can we allow this to be a thing? And me, I look at it, I'm very obviously very conservative, uh, as has been very present throughout this entire show. I think it's evil. I think it's immoral. I think it's something that is that is murder. But the end result is I get what I want, but I'm not happy with it. Like, I'm very happy in the real world. Roe v. Wade got overturned. But I'm not okay with how it happened. I'm not okay with the people who are utilizing it for their own ends versus uh, the preservation of life, which is what I would go towards. And, you know, the preservation of a human being created in the image of God. And then this scenario, Rosalind, I understand her position. It's one I never want to be in. 
but I don't agree with how she handles it. I think she's trying to have her cake and eat it too, and that's what blows up in her face. I think if she really, truly believes in her heart of hearts that uh, abortion should be legal, she should stick to her guns because it creates scenarios where we have Baltar manipulating things, things behind, behind the scenes to be like, oh, well, well, we're about to die out. Could you possibly allow this to happen while he's scheming, conniving? At the moment you say yes to this, you know, that, that serpent offering you the fruit, he's going to turn it and twist it against you. And he declares his own presidency, which she eventually loses along the way, uh, starting with this choice. Now, would that have happened if she had kept abortion there? I don't know. But it certainly doesn't help the matter here. So I'm well, all over yeah, the place there. But, but that kind of complexity, right, um, is the same kind I think we're experiencing now and are going to experience throughout this election season in America. Because, yes. like, assuming the logic of, you know, uh, personhood at fertilization, a IVF and rape, incest, life of the mother is life of the mother would essentially be the only. Uh, like what look at ethicists with that position, that's the only one where you're internally consistent. And yet, like just the offensiveness for 80% of the country that you would give that uh status to frozen art artificially fertilized and frozen embryos is such that uh that that the Republican Party are the ones that actually believe it, because I don't think Trump cares. He paid off he does that he doesn't. Uh, yeah, but 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 you see like um the like even those that really believe it, uh, whichever one the true believers are, aren't going to say it during the election uh, because they know it's a losing proposition that uh, even a majority of Southern Baptists support IVF. Right. So the the idea they and they make a moral difference, even though it's not it, it's a moral difference in interpretation, but it's not about the status of the fetus at that point. Um, it, in many ways, it's the, it, it is a, it a justified means for giving you the, like giving the, uh, family more control than nature gives you over, uh, life. <clears throat> and so like all what's going on in that, both like one side, uh, a very contextual moral reasoning that's complicated and undermines their deepest commitments. And the other one, not caring, but just wanting political control, uh, and will adopt anyone's deepest commitments. Right. Like both of them have ways in which they're off putting. And um, and and I imagine that, you know, for just, so, you know, when we're recording this, we're we're just now waking up to the the sequel. No one wanted. And and that kind of move is going to be rampant. So here we go. Yeah. You, oh, you know what? It, here, here was a question uh, that came up to me. I had to go look up when it happened uh, because you, when you sent the outline. It's in season uh, four where Ellen, who's like the original wife of like the lieutenant, what was his name? Um, Saul Ty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, so he, uh, she hurt six who's pregnant with his baby, right? And it generates a miscarriage um, in it. And the kind of... Uh, that story's moral complexity is very different than uh, the conversation around abortion. And, and I think it's because uh, what's happened since then, right? Like those numbers have gone down even more people, uh, the kind of fear of the other, right. Is deeply a part of it. So six is a Cylon. So like, well, and at that point they think this is a Cylon human uh, child um, hadn't been the big reveal there of who the original five are, and um, and so this kind of uh, it's raising the question it, for everyone: like, is this a human or not? And that frames the relationship of this potential hybrid child. Does it get dignity or not? Right. And after Ellen's hurt six, and there's a potential miscarriage, she's sitting there telling her ex husband. Um, you know, whisper to tell, tell him, tell her you love her and is like in the crisis of the potential loss of this child um, is the place where you see Ellen's character awakening to the potential dignity, even if it's not human 
uh, fully human of this child. Um, though that the anyway that that episode I think is, um, especially if you're teaching in class on this, where ethical questions come up, setting them next to each other is really helpful uh, because there's so many places where the other fertility in the other has been used by governments regularly uh in horrible ways sterilization of people with mental disabilities um the uh abortion of white women who have uh ch children with people of color um the, the um what do you do with the other's children re like the kind of like taking native american kids and re-education camp like uh you can see how it played out in nazi germany and such like the 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 politics of life in a time of crisis like continually gets more complex um all the way i mean there are other episodes but i just thought those two yeah uh go no, well together I, you jogged my memory it's been so long since i've seen that episode in particular and it's one of those things it, for me it's eugenics versus the preservation of life and when you start looking at someone as another, when you start thinking, well, oh, no, this, this chromosome is not going to be, you know, in line with everything else. They're going to have Down syndrome. They're going to have uh, this, like they're going to have muscular dystrophy or something like that. If I allow this child to come well, and decide in that case, oh, this human is this human Cylon baby. And we know it's going to be Cylon Cylon at this point in time. Uh, uh, do we have the right to kill it? Because it's not regular. It's not what we want it to be that's when i have a huge problem it's like sure I, there are many things in this world no one wants to have a, a disability no one wants to be mentally deficient in certain respects but that's part of the fallen world that we live in and that's part of the reality that we live in it is am i going to play god in that factor to then say you have you're more worthy of life than them because you fit this mold better would be how i would look at that Mm -hmm. All right. So, moving on from there, we've got all of the delicate topics we're discussing today. And Trippy already brought it up earlier. Uh, this show was created around the time of the War on Terror, uh, starting obviously with the 9 11 attacks, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq. Your mileage may vary on where you end up on that stage. Like, uh, and this received the show received many parallels in how the conflict between humans and Cylons were explored. Like when we get to New Caprica, we have suicide bombings by humans uh, to try and kill them. Uh, we have religion used as an excuse for war, in that the Cylons have a religion kind of based on this idea of Cylon supremacy. Then we have the Pegasus crew torturing Gina, who is another version of Six, who goes through a lot of uh, physical and mental uh, and sexual abuse. And the Cylons are going to later, you know, torture Baltar uh, for his role. Oh, sorry, I've got to put that image on there earlier. There we go. Uh, you know, for how he handles his time as president on New Caprica, like so, and amongst many others. So, what's your opinion on how this is all brought up in the show? Well, I, I, I think it kind of functions at two levels. One is, um, the, the role of religion through it is like continuously complexified so that the kind of easy uh, uh the easy parsing of good or bad religion doesn't hold the longer you move in the show i mean like the um even the relationship of a kind of a polytheistic framing and a monotheistic one um the the, the in the the terrorism elements um like as one get, as one comes to understand more of the Cylons and the way they share the humanity of their makers, um, the the line, uh, the the lines get increasingly blurry, and and those lines are the ones required uh, in the story for like terrorism justification, uh, justification of torture, and these kinds of things. Um, and, and I think the, uh, the, the kind of monotheistic picture that's expressed at the end on earth two uh, problematizes, um, uh, the, uh, most of the religious expressions prior. And so the, when I think of post nine 11, it, um, it, 
it was showing us just how ugly a religiously inspired trajectory of war uh, the it works. It problematizes calling one group of terrorists when their story, their freedom fighters. Uh, that was running throughout um, the whole thing. Uh, the, the questions of torture coming up, uh, right? Like in order to conquer a monster, you become one. Uh, and how does that, uh, how does that work? Uh, the big picture for me is, um, it, it is a, it, it can, I uh, maybe it doesn't have to be read this way, but at least, uh, and when I watched it the first time watching it with students, it becomes a real challenge to the kind of legitimation story that neocon foreign policy had um after 9 11 uh where you get uh this like generation of religiously funded tribal identity um it's it's where you start culturally where it where culture christianity's culture dominance uh in america uh gets rejected more and more generationally and uh so many of the people you know, I grew up with a uh, Baptist preacher's kid in the South uh, that told me about Jesus all of a sudden after 9-11 um, are the most Islamophobic and the most militaristic nationalistic people around uh, that the this show for me um, presented presented the perversity in ways some people saw it that they couldn't see it if they just, you know, made fun of me for going to a protest and clapped when we started bombing Iraq because it's somehow connected to Al Qaeda, which basic awareness of Islam would know they aren't friends. And, uh, you know, it's funded by lies um, that uh, we find out later are uh, or much more strategic. Um, and and yet who were the ones that were most patriotic in rallying up to go kill the muslim others uh in preemptive strike which breaks all uh just war uh even just war theory and rallied around the flag it was white christians in america um and the um uh, i mean that was when you know i personally you know disengaged from ever wanting to be associated with kind of white evangelicalism because just the basic teachings of Jesus were offensive. Um, I remember after 9-11, when uh, I, we were forced to go to chapel uh, at a Baptist school, um, and on 9-11, there was chapel, and we had just realized the second, when the second plane hits, you realize it's a terrorist attack. And whoever was preaching that day, I guess the Holy Ghost told them to go ahead and do Islamophobic uh, warmongering for their sermon, and after it, everyone starts, in a prayer circle, which at a Christian campus is, uh, you don't want to get out Jesus. And um, we're sitting there, my roommate and I, Mike are sitting there. And after about 30 or 40 minutes of listening to people pray, he runs off and I chase him. Cause I'm like, good. I don't, I don't have to, you know, do this. And he turns around and looks at me and says, you know, why? Well, well, I'm not going to curse, but he says, there's only one beep, beep, beep thing. Jesus said for today, it's pray for your enemies. And no one's thought about it. And and they didn't just not think about it. They go completely ignored it, lied to justify going to war and um, uh, allowed Islamophobia um, to run rampant in its churches. And that, that all that was in that space where I realized I didn't have a home anymore in the place that introduced me to the faith, um, all those complexities show up in a, in a show and it was so much more safe for me to talk about those things and share with people who didn't understand me because of this show rather than if i just read them the sermon on the mount somehow they already mm -hmm. had really good theological dodges for jesus not really meaning it uh but but the show introduces the complexities in way that conversation was facilitated so like that's why i think it's such a a one like a a wonderful show to capture how we were trying like this show is trying to be honest about the complexity of what's going on and it shows how religion can actually short circuit moral reasoning uh and become an ally to things that it theoretically you know testifies against in its texts and traditions
Well said. Yeah. I, I said this on the Gundam episode we did for this series earlier, but I'm not nearly as jingoistic now as I was when I was, you know, 18 or much earlier. 9-11 happened. I was 10 or 11 at the time. And in the church, most, thank God, in the church I was attending, it was, hey, we're going to support our troops. But it wasn't like, hey, bomb them all the hell. While me, internally, I'm thinking that. It's like, how dare they attack a Christian nation like us in this way? It's like, we should bomb them all to hell, back to the Stone Age, forgetting the fact that I am called to love my neighbor. I am called to pray for my neighbor. I'm not called to stand by and do nothing when they do evil against me and others. But that doesn't necessitate making them this demonic figure that has no redeeming values whatsoever, and therefore it's okay if they end up dying. So wrestling with that as someone who does believe in a, you know, a just cause for uh, the war on terror is extremely hard because I don't, as mentioned before, I don't like that we went into Iraq under false pretenses. I would have preferred if we'd have been honest and said, hey, like there's a dictator there. We need to get rid of dictators. Dictator's bad. And unfortunately, as a result of that, we end up causing religious strife in the area, causing Shias and Sunnis to end up fighting against one another. And then we had the Kurds, unfortunately, eternally screwed over by whichever side they decide to work with, who should have been made a nation of, of their own after you know France and Britain had their own thing way back in the day, but that's its own issue. Like, how, how am I supposed to handle this? Well, a show like this can show me, like from the perspective of the human uh, we're going to call them freedom fighters, but they're doing terrorist actions against the silence who are an occupying force. Well, that's a parallel to what these religious groups are doing. They see the United States forces, uh, other nations' forces as evil, as occupiers, as someone who is destroying their way of life. And you cannot force someone to think the way you do, as even if we think it's the right thing to do, that's something that they're going to have to do in their own time. And it was made very clear. Uh, several, some of them did not want that, so it leads to the rise of stuff like the Islamic State. And in the show proper, we have all this justification. We, and that's what humans are really good at. We can justify anything. It starts from the fall. Well, uh, because the woman told me to, because the serpent told me to. It's not because I wanted to do it. It's uh, they led me astray. And, right. and that and, and see, it's that recognition, which is why. Which is why in that moment, uh, both in the show and in American kind of like Christian debate things, it it to me, when Jesus says uh, to pray for your enemies. To turn the other cheek and these kinds of things. um that is a particular response to how one breaks the cycle of violence of victim and violator, which in this show, the Cylons and humans have done a whole bunch of times. Right. And the, it, it, like you get that in his teachings, but also the cross is the revelation that that's exactly what God's doing. God is embracing the power of perverse civilization that builds crosses for people and does so not by, um, Jesus doesn't bow the knee to Satan and become a kindler, gentler Caesar, or just fulfill all their material needs, or surf, surf off the top of the uh, the mountain or the, the the mount of the temple and be like, "Look, I'm God." Right? He he comes inviting us to internalize and participate in the very coming of God's kingdom, precisely by loving your enemy and turning the other cheek. It is asking us to embody the way that is ultimately exemplified in the cross, that's how you turn uh, enemies into family and friends is by that means, right? And when, 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 when you look at this story, both how it plays out, right, going through it, and then you put the big story that this cycles happen over and over again, I have a hard time thinking, like if you sit there with Six and Gaius at the end, um, that, that they think, like, do, does this all have to happen again? They, in one way, since you'd go, well, not if the same mind is in these people that was in Christ Jesus, who didn't count equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking the form of the servant, even 
to death on a cross, right? Like, or maybe a community that's identity is understood in how it treats its enemies and those that persecute them and how they turn the other cheek and all these kinds of things. And yet what happens so often is it, it, the religion that testifies to this this uh, this enemy transforming kind of love that goes beyond sin, law, and death gets turned into one little box where we do our personal ethics while we're ultimately subservient, subservient to American hegemony and global dominance and exporting our economic system. And so we come up with all sorts of just so stories to act as if uh, Jesus uh, bore a cross so that we could put our enemies on them. And when we do that, I like to me, that was what like that was the falsification to me of so much of the faith I was handed. And I remain pr continuously suspicious of how quickly Christians can um, change, pray for your enemies and turn the other cheek. And Jesus going all the way to the cross, knowing exactly what's going to happen, right? That's the Mount of Transfiguration. He starts to go down the mountain. It says he turns his face towards Jerusalem. And Peter's like, Jesus, you know what's going to happen there. They're going to kill you. Like, this is a horrible game plan for our coming, you know, bringing your kingdom. James and John are like, why are you going to do that? Like, can we be on the right and left? He's like, you don't know what you're asking for because it's going to a cross. And yet the moment you hand Christians imperial power and they feel like they are the best stewards of civilization, the body of Christ somehow thinks it could do a better job uh, bowing its knee to Satan that Jesus refuses to do in the temptation. And um, and and in the end of this story is, will it all happen again? Well, it will happen again as long as we think that we are in the position, just like Gaius at the beginning, to know enough, control enough, and to know the truth enough that we can decide when manipulation of others happens, when violence is justified, when torturing our enemies can happen this way, when we can tell a story where now everyone's focused on doing X, Y, and Z, and I do this. Christians have spent their our entire history, I feel like, testifying that we are just as sinful as the, as the ones that killed Jesus. And then we act like we're the only enlightened ones that can run things. And so let's render everyone into an axis of evil. Or before that, let's, so it's a battle from the Cold War. And in the present, it gets strung up on uh, a, a culture war framing, like where Christians' identity gets rallied because we have to conquer, defeat, and eliminate enemies. And that, to me, is just so sub-Christian. It's, it's as anti-Christ as it gets, you know, without using cool uh, dragons and junk. Sorry, I was my... Yeah, I get. I, I I didn't preach last weekend, so this you know when I'm, when I'm oh. off, it happens. I knew what I was getting into when we were going to record this episode, man. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but I do also know you have many things you have to do today, so I'm going to move on to our next question. Even though I would love to spend three hours talking about this, so when we get throughout the show from the very beginning, uh, Galactica kind of speaks a lot on paranoia with one of the, the many recurring worries of the survivors in the fleet being that there might be Cylons hidden among the fleet. They could be in positions of authority. They could be the guy you just met the other day. Like, in your opinion, how is this executed, and what can we learn from how it's portrayed? Well, the, you know, to me, part of the paranoia problem is what it does. Like, paranoia enables the people you know um, uh, it, it it generates a tribal identity by finding the object of your ire. And then paranoia now takes all your anxiety and fear in a moment and then generates it on an other and you don't know who they are. It also generates a fear where you might get called the one you're looking for, right? And it is a it is it is a deteriorous thing towards the kind of uh the, the kind of fear faith, not like in the religious sense, but the kind of trust you need for a healthy cooperative community, right? Like paranoia in a home where like one parent thinks the other one has this agenda or this kid's doing this. Like the moment you think the true story that explains the other is one where they're an enemy and that is the end of their dignity, then it gets ugly. Uh, that plays out through the it's how like in one of the most painful difficult episodes is where starbuck tortures the cylon yeah. 
and it was not it was not in her character until um uh violence conflict fear and these things emerge the the paranoia can short circuit our ability to um, for moral reasoning or uh uh empathy and identification with the other right that it it is the it is so toxic to the kind of hospitality that's required for genuine relationships uh it builds you to put up walls both to protect yourself from being found out even if it's not true because you know at the heart of the paranoid state of of relations that um reality is not required uh for <laughs> condemnation and it also you're building up walls because you don't want to get associated and become guilty by association and things it it um it really shows how these kind of lies about the other on steroids uh break down the the community's uh fabric um it, it, when you think of it what is there a particular part of i mean i could think of a whole bunch of different moments paranoia pops up but is there one that you know is most striking for you like when you pick this on the on the sheet yeah that, that's an excellent question i want to say like it'd probably be something like really early on because i think that's when it was kind of at its height uh a specific example is not really coming to my head, but uh, Ellen Ty coming back. There we go. Mm -hmm. Just happens to magically come back uh, from the fleet's perspective. And you have this debate, you know, Saul wants his wife wife back. And, like he thought she was gone. Uh, you have it, Bill Adama going, yeah, I don't know about this. Like this, this is all my, my Adama senses are tingling. Yeah. And you also have Rosalind working for this. Oh, we just added the number to the fleet. And you have Galt <laughs> Baltar in the middle of this. <laughs> being Baltar and re telling them one thing while refusing to tell the audience another about what she actually is. And, I, and as a viewer, I'm feeling paranoid because you just told me there's a possibility you just told a lie. Yeah. And it's moments like that, that heighten it, make you feel like you're part of that action. It's like, if I'm here, do I, I mean, I have no reason not to trust Baltar. But I, as a viewer, know I have plenty of what? reasons <laughs> not to trust him. So they just accept it. And as time goes on, we do find out, hey, Ellen is actually a Cylon. Now, if that had been revealed earlier, how the series have changed? Was that always the plan? I don't think the writers always had a plan. But they eventually made something work. Uh, I think work really well, and ultimately. And getting this idea is like, it's kind of also inspired by playing the board game. And that's where those cards are from, if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, you get handed, uh, if you're just playing the game normally, you start the game with one card that reveals if you're a Cylon or not, then there's a second phase of the game where there's a higher chance of you becoming a Cylon. So that creates paranoia, excuse me, paranoia amongst the group of, well, I used to be able to trust this person, but can I trust them now? <laughs> and like I said earlier, it's a great way to ruin friendships. Yeah. Because we're, we're kind of working under the assumption you're on my team, right? And if there's something that makes you go, wait, you're not on my team, you have you have this belief about Jesus, you have this belief about you know inerrancy, you're not looking at literally or something like that, and you kind of question, well, are you really his? And then you kind of go back because the obvious answer being, of course, I'm his. So I know, I know where I'm, yeah. but what about you? Yeah, the um the about a year ish ago. My family moved back to the States, but to North Carolina, and we were in California for 10 years and then um, Scotland for three. And so, you know, we moved um, w right after the election before Obama was inaugurated, right, to Los Angeles. And so coming back here and reconnecting with, you know, extended members of family and friends you had and such growing up um like the paranoia things that emerge where they just assume i'm one of theirs and then say stuff is quite shocking like having family members explain to me how obama was a muslim and not oh, american gosh. and yeah well they got it from president trump so i mean you know what i mean yeah. like it, it's like people say that and then half the country's about to go vote for him again um, rants about the deep state being kitty touchers and a globalist cabal, 
um that kind of stuff i a uh, uh, a neighbor who's like to me wonderfully kind but starts repeating trump's vermin rhetoric not knowing he's talking about me uh when he's mentioning it um that kind of uh that like the the paranoia i i had around like trans bathroom laws and like i, I was just sitting there going like well, you you know that there are are 6,800 and some uh, sexual assaults to children by family members for one by someone that's not a family member. But see the, like, and see in one sense, you might go like, well, we share the value of kids, but it's not about, it's not even about the kids at that point. It's about this paranoia of some potential other that you don't understand being in a position that has some connection to you. Um, be it a trans person in a bathroom, uh, a civil servant that's secretly doing whatnot, uh, a president who's an another religion um, and uh, and probably not even a, a true president, uh, these kinds of things. And like going out of all these relationships past like kind of thinking, well, that's an interesting Facebook post. And then showing back up like when I think of that kind of paranoia thing, I think. Yeah, you know what it does is it 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 contorts uh, the fabric of our relationships in ways that I'm going to build up a wall. I don't want them to like hear me say X, Y, and Z, and then judge me for this or that, and then it makes things difficult. And then like like it just it's it it breaks the fabric. And if that's happening right, like in the show, uh, when you're one of the initial fifty thousand humans left, and it leads to the death of more and more of them. Right. And you think of this show after 9-11, right? Like the impact of 9-11 and then you get um, uh, Obama as president and you can see more and more of this stuff go. And then and I'm sure that there you will have experiences of the same kind of thing from people that are more politically progressive. But like the way uh, where these people, you know, don't share certain values. Now I'm going to inscribe them into this problem where they're what vermin to be eliminated. Um, this kind of thing. And, uh, what, and, and it's, it's when the paranoia sabotages your ability to recognize, um, the, the humanity of the other, um, then it, it's deteriorous to our own humanity. And that, that plays out in the show in ways that when I watch it, it, it makes me question the way I end up doing it. And, um, when I watched it in such, when I was, you know, not in this context and coming back, it makes me feel like, what is it like if I, you, if this kind of, uh, a, a scapegoat style paranoia, uh, how does it shape me? And, and whose humanity am I, um, not allowing to, to come into me because it would mean they demand recognition that I'm not, I'm not comfortable giving them. Because somehow the difference between us is a difference that gives them less dignity or something. Yeah. It's not to say, what's the difference between paranoia and being right? It kind of depends on what happens. I, 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 some, I'm sure there's some better way to word that. Because you, you have the early church. And they're forced to live in the midst of persecution and not knowing who they can trust and what's going on. Then you have some other people saying, hey, like, didn't you know there's this secret gnosis over here that you have to – I'm the only one who can teach you about. And if you just join this and your salvation is assured, or you have someone saying, but did Jesus really say that he was God? I mean, surely he was a created being and all this. And you got to wrestle with those. You can't. And that paranoia amounts to something. You got to worry about something like that. that. That's something to be worried about. Is something serious like that? You have a nation state. You have to be worried to an extent about foreign interlopers coming in to mess with you if you're in a current state of war with them, but not at the expense of people. How do you handle all that? I don't know. That's why I'll never go or seek any sort of sort of government office. I don't want to be the guy making that call. Uh, but th there's got to be a way to have a healthy amount of skepticism in the world around you. 
to question someone's motives without like questioning them based off of you know some stupid reason like race or their political ideology or something like that just listen to what they have to say it's like hey i'm conservative i am never gonna vote for trump again i voted for him in 2016 i was an idiot i i sacrificed my morals and values for to not put hillary clinton in office i'll I'll tell that to everyone here right now. It's not gonna, I'm not going to make the same mistake again uh, if he ends up becoming the Republican nominee, which it sounds like it will. But you've got to have a healthy way of saying, this person is saying this. Do they actually align with what I'm saying? Do they actually care about the same things I do? Are, are they here uh, in a show like this? C- can you trust a person beside you? Well, can you really trust anyone? Yeah. Sure, if you know them, if you spent time with them, and that takes time. That takes me getting over, ah, they're the unknown. What do I do with that? And as an introvert, I hate the unknown. And then it requires more work. But it's something worth doing. Now, Trip, do you have anything else you want to add before we uh, head over to the wrap-up here? Oh, no, no. But I, I think, well, I would just say, I think you're right that there's a difference between kind of a, a critical ref- reflective kind of skepticism and paranoia um and it's not just like in retrospect something appears to be paranoia like after you know the facts part of what part of what the paranoia the the problem that plays out in the show um is that the potential for a reality even one that is real gets uh amplified to the point that um, other people become victims of a a real possible threat, right? So, like, if we think of what happened in the show, think of the way even not just Muslims, Sikh people in America were treated oh, after nine eleven, right? It, it, it the religious um, ignorance of it all. Yeah, it, it but it but the paranoia was connected to a real thing, right? There was real Islamic terrorism. Does it is it somehow connected to? Iraq when the uh, hijackers are from Saudi Arabia and they don't like each other seems weird, but you know that like so the so the I, I think you're right like to avoid it doesn't mean you aren't grounded from somewhere attempting to understand and articulate and embody your own values. It's the um it's the kind of uh, dialing up the need usually for security security right becomes the justification for all sorts of paranoia you can think of what happened after 9 11 but you could also think of like in the 90s uh people like the fear um and then like halloween becomes this whole thing like you got to check your candy and uh but, uh, it, like there are lots of times you get these scares all the way back to like witch trials and and such um so like knowing that it's a part of human psychology um that has a positive purpose uh when utilized correctly that then when it gets dialed up and you turn it up to 11 of sorts like something that actually is supposed to help you think of like good or not good healthy or not healthy and like making that discernment once it gets turned up where now you're so focused on your own protection um it ends up cutting you off uh uh from human beings who could who are your neighbors they bear the image of god and could contribute to your own existence um and I, and i think that's where that le- learning a kind of healthy critical kind of skepticism is needed um and paranoia type things are uh, uh a, a short circuit of sorts to when it's done well all right yeah this was a, such a fun episode to record uh i know we have other things we have to do today so let's head over to the wrap up and part of what we're asking everyone on the show as kind of like the final question of sorts for this series is like uh what real life politician would enjoy your favorite movie Ooh, i don't know i mean my my favorite movie is either i mean like i love the lord of the rings extended editions if I guess the count as one movie where I get all three of them, then um, I think uh, I think I, I think every politician could deeply enjoy it because um, 
you see a host of different people who recognize the kind of sacrifices uh, that duty require, the kind of uh, the kind of inherited binaries and boundaries to your community of belonging that have to be ruptured to find the birth of a new age. Um, and uh, it places uh, our ultimate deepest hopes in the future are not in the ones commanding armies that come from high born and with power. Uh, but uh, for friends with hairy feet who, uh, who embrace a task and a burden at a time they would have never choose. Um, and it's their deep friendship that makes a future possible for everyone. And, given the way our political system is creating a culture where friendship across longtime enemies orbs and uh dwarves and elves um uh, a culture that um resists the wisdom uh that has been handed down be it from someone like gandalf who's been around a long time or the or the 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 songs of the dwarves or the council of Elrond, um, and, and one that they is the more, the more you break down social fabric, uh, the, the, the shallower and fewer friendships are there. And I, I'm rather confident that, um, the, the powerful and are, are not the solution to the problems they've created. And if we spent more time thinking of how we, 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 we build communities where friendships are formed that can sustain a walk into Mordor, we would have a much more beautiful, um, a more beautiful world and a very different agenda uh, for uh, political debates. That was wonderfully and beautifully said. And to pull a full Joshua here, I'm going to go silly on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> um, I already mentioned my favorite movie last time was Return of the Jedi. I don't know if, I, if I'm if i ranking the other movies, if this would actually be my second, but for the sake of answering the question, I, I think that FDR would enjoy uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I think the man needs a, little, he needs a little silliness in his life after dealing with the Great Depression and World War II and his own medical issues. Like, I think a little bit of Monty Python could go a long way to making FDR a little happier. Oh, now a real question is you, episode six might be your favorite, um, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't go mess with the prequels prior to four and five, right? As in, well, i have Joshua, uh, you know, he's, he really likes the prequels and I just found that so disturbing. And I was like, what kind of heresy is this? You're passing off. Look, I, that's why, that's why I was checking. Is this like a whole, is this part is a sneaky part of systematic ecology that the prequels all come before empire strikes back? Yeah. It, it, objectively empire strikes back is the best movie in the original trilogy. I oh. just love return more. Look, okay. Uh, let's. Uh, this is a good a moment of unity, Joshua. I just want you to know, uh, Christian and I. There's our like. How many deep theological and political commitments do we share? Um, just that so we enjoy talking about Battlestar Galactica, and we're trying to respect each other, and had a lot of fun doing it. But you know what? I think we know what the one true heresy is: in systematic ecology, commitment to the prequels. What? The, what is that? What is that? I think we need to have a high quality trial where he has to have Jar Jar Binks as his defense attorney and Misa Gunza puts him on trial trying to pass that off as peak cinema when the other option <laughs> involves Luke, Han, Leia, and Chewie. What, what is this? To speak on Josh's defense, I, I think you have him wrong. I don't think he likes the prequels more than the original trilogy. I, I think he's more harsh on them. I do enjoy the prequels. I think they're heavily flawed and should have been written uh, with a better editor for Lucas, but well, he, yeah, he I'll, I'll take them over to sequel trilogy the, any day. He gave me a hard time on whole church podcast. I don't know if the episode came out, but yet, but I was like, yeah, the greatest movie is episode five. Like that's the best star Wars movie. And he was going on and on. I'm just like, I don't understand. That would be, that would be like being like, well, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And someone's like, Oh, Leviticus. And you're <laughs> like, but you're, are you, 
or what? And you're like, look, there's lots of cool stuff in there. And it's a lot of fun, but like favorite Did you write a dissertation on it? They're like, no, no, I just, I just dig it. And you're like, well, have you thought about any of the gospels? No, nah, that's, that's really not my thing. I like laws about where you're allowed to take dumps. And there's really only one place to go for proper defecation spots as dictated by the divine. And yeah. you know, Jesus never covered all you get is like in Matthew. He says, like, don't even mess with the vow signs on the Hebrew Bible. And so we know it's still true, but like that was already covered. So he didn't, you've heard it said, take a dump outside the city. But I say unto you, use sanitation. You know, that wasn't in there. What a wonderful way to end this episode. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>